Hello and welcome to Mythmakers. Mythmakers is the podcast for fantasy fans and fantasy creatives brought to you by the Oxford Centre for Fantasy. My name is Julia Golding. I'm an author and screenwriter, but also director of the centre. Today I'm going to carry on with my series of, of fantasy books that you really should get round to reading. And my pick today might well already be well known to you, but you might not have thought about it as a fantasy story. And today's pick is A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens. Now, why is this fantasy? Well, the very first thing to remember is that it is structured around Scrooge being visited by three ghosts. Now, you may say, well, actually, ghosts are horror. Uh, they're, they're re they could be real. But the way uh, the ghosts transport him through the equivalent of portals to his past, to different places in his present and to his future uh, is very much a sort of fantasy trope. So I'm claiming it for fantasy. A Christmas Carol was first published in 1843 by the London publisher Chapman and Hall. And that edition has illustrations by John Leach, which you may also have seen because if you Google them, you'll find them. And they have those images about around which many of the adaptations have sort of picked on of the um, what Scrooge looks like and what the ghosts look like. So it was a very uh, wonderful production to launch this book. And I think present day authors would love to have that treatment of fully illustrated novella around Christmas time. I mean, it was the dream package, really. It was wildly successful in its own era. And Charles Dickens went on to write several other Christmas books, a bit like we now have the Christmas movies. He started producing the Christmas books because Charles Dickens was quite a canny marketing person. So why have I chosen The Christmas Carol? Well, I've chosen it because it is one of those books, one of those fantasy books, which has become a lens through which we see something. And in his case, it's the Christmas period. Charles Dickens was writing at a time when Christmas was being sort of redefined. So if you read 18th century accounts in England of Christmas, um, it was very much focused around 12 days of Christmas, feasting. Um, there was some idea of mumming, where you would go from house to house, and sort of traditional mummers, like entertainers, would knock on doors, carol singers. Um, but there wasn't this overwhelming sense of peace and goodwill. Um, that sort of, it's the most important time of the year kind of pressure that the season has now attracted. It still had uh, its roots in obviously the winter festival that the Christian church borrowed in order to set the birthday of Christ. But it wasn't such a huge deal as it is since the Victorian period. And Victorians themselves began to redefine Christmas. Um, you probably already know the story of Queen Victoria's husband, Albert, bringing in some uh, traditions from Germany. So things like the Christmas tree. And of course, we get the rise and rise and rise of the image of Father Christmas at this time, uh, St. Nicholas, who was once upon a time primarily described as a saint and he sort of morphed over the uh, over this period into being the sort of Santa Claus Father Christmas who is now a star in many a movie. So Christmas was in flux. Into this comes Charles Dickens who loved a party and he loved theatricals and I think both of these are very evident in the way he thought of Christmas in A Christmas Carol. So let's think about it as a piece of writing before we turn to the adaptations of it. If you haven't read it, and you may well have perhaps think you know it so well that you may not have actually read the book, um, you might be surprised to find that it is structured in staves. So he's playing on the idea that it's a Christmas carol. So it's got staves or verses like a carol would. And it's got a very, very strong structure. So you have the first stave, a kind of prologue piece where Scrooge is sitting in his office, making life miserable for Bob Cratchit, um, refusing to support 
causes for the poor, turning away the carol singers, all the stuff that makes it into the films. And actually, it's interesting that very few of the plot moves are left out uh, when you see adaptations because Dickens has such a strong structure. Then he goes home and it's while he's preparing to go to bed that he is visited by his old partner, Jacob Marley, who appears as the ghost carrying his cash boxes. And he warns that what you do in life follows you after death. But the problem about being dead is you can't do anything about it. You can only weep for the people that you mistreated. And Scrooge is in his, um, his not wanting to believe in this um, phase. And so he has the wonderful line that he accuses uh, Jacob Marley of being a piece of undigested cheese. You know, he, he sort of is rationalising it. So then we move into uh, the second stage, which is the first visitation by the ghost of Christmas past. So Scrooge goes to bed and he sees a light and he gets up and finds that Jacob Marley, who promised him the visit of three ghosts, um, has been correct because there is the ghost of Christmas past. But it then goes on to the, the next stave, which is the ghost of Christmas present. And then the penultimate one is uh, the ghost of Christmas future or to come. And then finally, you get the sort of coda or the last phase, which is the renewed reformed Scrooge, the one where he wakes up and sends the biggest goose on sale round to the Cratchits and goes to see his nephew who he has shunned and joins in the party. So the first thing to talk about is just the beauty of that structure. One of the things that we don't often talk about with Dickens is how he structures things and probably because his novels are quite long it, it might be hard to see how he works it out but in this novella it you see what a beautiful job he makes of that. So if you're listening to this as a creative and you're thinking, what's a good example of structuring? Have at <laughs> A Christmas Carol. It's a very good place to look. Another thing about it, which I picks up on his love of the theatre, is it does feel very theatrical. They are like scenes. Um, it very strongly moves from one scene to another. Not normally with that many people involved. There is a couple of party scenes where... Um, it's beautifully described where, Sc where Scrooge is a spectator on his younger self and he wants to join in and he can't, but he's guessing the, he's guessing the conundrums and he, you know, he's the outsider, like there's a frosted plane pain between him and the action. Um, so it, it's very theatrical and surprise, surprise, when you look up the number of theatre adaptations of this, they are endless. Uh, you probably are at the very moment living near somewhere that is putting on a Christmas carol this Christmas. Um, so, and the other thing about it, which makes it a really good piece of writing, I think, is the delightful characterization of Scrooge. There are wonderful characters in it all the way through, but Scrooge himself is the standout favorite because he is both wonderful before and after. So this curmudgeonly man, the miserable, miserable old man that gives us the word to be like Scrooge, um, is beautifully delineated through the choice of some details like how cheap he is about his own dinner. You know, he's not dining on uh, venison or anything. He's, he's eating gruel and he doesn't heat his house and... Uh, it doesn't heat his office. It's just all these details and the way that he doesn't even want to give his poor clerk the day off for Christmas. He feels it's like daylight robbery that he's allowed to go home for Christmas. These details are wonderfully over the top, wonderfully. Um, it just solidifies him in our mind and it starts him at a point. So his story arc is even more enjoyable. If he had any redeeming features at that point, well, he does have one, which I'll come to in a moment, but mostly he shows no redeeming features. His redeeming feature is that he did 
love, I suppose, his partner, Jacob Marley. There was affection there, even if it was like two um, difficult people banding together. So he is moved by the visit of the ghost. And I suppose that is the chink in his heart, which is widened by the visitation of the ghosts. So again, if you're a person who's wanting to write um, a character like this, who starts really, really far down on the sort of baddie scale, um, if you give him these redeeming features, that is what you work at and open up so that they can go on the trajectory that Scrooge goes on. He's also funny. This is something we often forget in the power of being funny in fantasy. Um, a lot of the most successful fantasy series have it within. There are comedy themes. They don't take themselves too seriously. So Scrooge himself is, we are invited to laugh at him. It's kind of appalled laughter, but it's laughter nonetheless. And then you get the figure, of course, when he's being taken around by the ghost of this guy in his nightshirt, um, trailing around behind these ghosts. One of the ghosts is this great big sort of um, spirit of Christmas past, sort of almost jovial figure. And then this wizard old man, you know, it's funny. Um, and what he says is funny. And his reaction when he reforms is also absurd and funny you know sort of blessing the boy for being a bit cheeky when they're talking about um what what time it is and what day it is so there is a affection i think from the author to that character which comes across in a kind sort of humor and a really important ingredient in that character is an understanding of why he is how he is the story is set up to show us it goes back to his neglect, neglect as a child, um, his grief over his sister and rejection. You know, the, his, the way he, he sw swerved towards serving mammon rather than love and took some wrong choices which ended up him as a bitter old man. So it looks behind, looks under the bonnet of what makes Scrooge the character he is. And that buys us in to root for him. So when he sees his future, we are with him saying, don't go there, don't go there. So we're not rejoicing in the downfall of the bad guy. We're wanting to stop him. Um, so that in itself is a wonderful way to build a character who starts off quite repellent, but to carry your audience with you. If that's something you'd be interested in having a go at writing, it's quite difficult that is. Another reason, strong visuals. When I think of A Christmas Carol, which I have read many times and heard it and watched it, there are certain scenes that, are, that I can conjure in my head, like um, Bob Cratchit trying to nurse some um, flame out of this poor little piece of coal in his, uh, in his fire grate. Um, Another picture, of course, is Tiny Tim being carried on the shoulders of his father. Uh, Scrooge going to his bedroom later on and finding, when in the future, finding the char ladies sort of haggling over his bedclothes. These things, are, you, you'll have your own. There are lots of very powerful images and probably the most powerful of them all is the confrontation between Jacob Marley the ghost and Scrooge before he goes on this journey of reformation with the cash boxes and lock boxes and chains representing what he did uh, Jake what Jacob did to all the people they had fleeced and telling Ebenezer yours is even bigger I can see it but you can't so that image if you someone just sketched it out for me, I know exactly which story I'm in. Uh, and it's a it's an image which has the weight of the story in it because there's an element of comedy in it with this guy wrapped up in chains, but also it's deeply serious about the neglect of the poor in that age and in our own. And before we move on to the adaptations, I just wanted to also mention the the language. It reads beautifully. 
So just the um, the opening, Marley was dead to begin with. There is no doubt whatever about that. The register of his burial was signed by the clergyman, the clerk, the undertaker and the chief mourner. Scrooge signed it and Scrooge's name was good upon change for anything he chose to put his hand to. Old Marley was as dead as a doornail. It's written to be read aloud. And the language, um, it's a very well told story and you could hear the voice of the person telling it. I always have in my mind like the, another kind of ghost, the ghost of the Victorian family listening to this. Um, and it is, it is a very good book to listen to in audible form uh, if, if you want to treat yourself something to listen to whilst you're doing the washing up because it reads so beautifully aloud. So the language is very energetic, um, full of wonderful little turns of phrase which are quintessentially Dickensian. Like after that bit about the doornail, he goes on to have a little peroration about doornails, <laughs> um, which is very Dickens. But also part of the world of this book, which is the um, the world of Victorian England, where it's kind of iron, mud, coal, um, bed, bed caps, you know, all that stuff. It's sort of a whole landscape, a lexical landscape is built in this beautifully in a small space, which of course makes the, uh, the green and the red and the gold and the festivities shine all more brightly. It's a wonderful use of the contrast between the sort of niggardly um, Scrooge sitting, you know, eating his his gruel and then going into the feast scene. Those sort of contrasts are, are extremely well done. Undoubtedly it is melodramatic. And the melodrama is also rooted in Dickens' love of the stage. And it was quite fitting that this was one of the works which he used as part of his stage show. Um, Dickens had a battle with controlling copyright. So there was very hard for him to get money from books published abroad at this time. They could be pirated, particularly in America. So one of the things he did to sort of protect his own income from his own work is, is live performance. It's a very modern issue really, isn't it? It's the equivalent of um, people doing their, you know, Ed Sheeran going on tour. So he did public readings of it and I was looking up and it says online that he undertook 128 performances or thereabouts until his death in 1870. So um, it was a regular feature more than one, you know, a couple of times, three or four times a year uh, in order to, um, you know, increase his income. Good for him. So the importance of this book though, as well as being very well written, a lovely f example of a novella, I would say if you're thinking about the short form, the other wonderful novella of this period is um, George Eliot's Silas Marner, which I can't recommend them enough. They would make a lovely little duo to read over Christmas. Um, but this particular one, The Christmas Carol, I think has helped the invention of Christmas as it is today. It shows how fantasy can f frame our reaction to something. The thing, one of the things about it that is, it's a Christian story in that um, part of it is the idea of the redemption and it refers to uh, Dickens' faith and practices at the time in, in the sort of structure of how Scrooge sees the error of his ways. But it's only lightly so. Um, so it can be adopted, the outline of that redemption story can be adopted by people of faith and no faith, which is why it's gone out into popular culture. Many of the adaptations don't mention the overt Christian aspect, which is in the, the Christmas Carol itself. And boy, has it spread. So I was looking at when was the, um, the film versions of this, how many were there? And the list is formidable. The first one was in 1901, a very, very early film. This is like the babyhood of cinema itself. And Wiki, 
so therefore it must be true, lists at least 21 live action versions, 11 animated, and then when you scroll down, you find there's also TV series, uh, derivative works, all sorts of things. So you can see how it's spread out far and wide uh, into our understanding of Christmas. But I think it's not just the the story of the Christmas Carol itself, you know, the Muppet Christmas Carol or whatever. It's not just that. It's also the concept of Christmas as a time of when that sort of good heartedness can, the reformation can happen. Um, and I'm thinking that really films like It's a Wonderful Life owe a lot to the kind of belief that Christmas was a time when you would be different or when you could be different. It's a sort of a slightly intangible thing because there is also the the sort of the religious input story, of course, uh, in society as well. But I think in popular culture, people would recognise it, that spirit in stories like and starting with A Christmas Carol. So that's my must read. It's a nice short one. Uh, so do look it up and uh, or catch a performance of it somewhere because I think that it, bar humbug, Christmas wouldn't be Christmas without Scrooge. So we always end myth makers with where in all the fantasy worlds is the best place for something. And in honour of Scrooge, we'll have to say, where is the best place to be a miser? Well, what, what kind of world benefits a miser? That is one where you can actually control your wealth and keep hold of it. So I was actually thinking, what, what are misers in fantasy literature? And of course, immediately, if you think about it, dragons. Dragons amass treasure and sit on it. And don't share it. So perhaps the answer to this one is the place where, it, where it's a good idea, you know, where it's good to be a dragon. So it would be Middle Earth until The Hobbit arrives. You know, if you're Smaug all the centuries before, you had quite a good life um, ruling your mountain. Or it could be going way back in the world of Beowulf because the last monster that Beowulf fights is a dragon who's a mass treasure. Um, it could be in the world of Beowulf until Beowulf arrives. So I think where in all the best worlds to be a miser is to be a dragon somewhere before the person comes to disrupt your rather nice quiet life with your lovely treasure. Thank you very much for listening and if you have any suggestions of your must-read fantasy books do let us know otherwise look forward to seeing you next time